Um, so my name is Lee Kimberg, and I am a primary care physician in internal medicine, primary care. I work at San Francisco General, um, and I do violence prevention work as well. Um, and four years ago, I uh, took a midlife career switch to um, enter the world of medical education. Um, it's been truly um, a blessing to um, enter this world and get to work with um, really brilliant and dedicated students um, and uh, really phenomenal medical educators that we have at UCSF and at the joint medical program at UC Berkeley, too. Um, so I'm going to start out providing a little bit of introduction, and then, and then we'll move on from there. So um, tonight we're going to talk about first um, uh, Prime. Uh, what is Prime? Who are we? Um, health equity, which is why we do uh, the work that we do. Um, and then we're going to talk about community engagement and why partnerships between um, academic institutions and community organizations are so critical to promoting health equity. And then uh, the highlight of the evening is that we are going to have two of our students speak with you about work that they've done in partnership with communities um, in the Bay Area. So um, in the state of California, um, as you can imagine, we are the most populous state in the country. We're also one of the most diverse states. Like if you think of uh, racial and ethnic diversity, we're one of the most diverse states. We have many other aspects of diversity as well. Um, and we unfortunately have incredible health disparities in um, California. So um, differences in health um, between advantaged and disadvantaged populations um, in our state. And then on top of that, we actually don't have the physician workforce necessary to help eliminate those health and healthcare disparities. So if we just take one example, um, for example, of the population of Latino residents in California, 40% of our state um, is Latino residents of, of California. And um, physicians, um, there are only 5% of Latino physicians in the state of California. Um, many of those, about a third of those, are estimated to be retiring within the next 10 years. So there's a future looming, even worsening crisis in terms of how many Latino physicians there will be in the state. Um, and then in medical schools, there are only 9% of medical students are Latino. So we can see um, that um, we don't really have the diverse physician workforce that we need to care for such a diverse population in our state. So in the early 2000s, um, the University of California and the state legislature and leaders across the state, including at UCSF, got together and started talking about what are we going to do about the fact that California has such incredible health disparities and we don't actually have the physician workforce to be able to solve uh, those health and health care disparities. So they decided to form a program called the Program in Medical Education, the Programs in Medical Education, um, to increase the diversity of the workforce, many different aspects of diversity, not just racial, ethnic diversity, um, and um, expand the size of medical school classes in order to do that. Um, and uh, there were various funding streams, including um, some public funding through the legislature to, to form those programs in medical education. So these are uh, the programs that exist throughout the state. The first program that was uh, formed was the UC Irvine Program in Medical Education for the Latino Community um, in 2004. And we were uh, the second uh, program to be formed. In 2006 was our pilot year, and then 2007 was the official launch. Um, and as you can see, each of these different prime programs has a particular focus. So for example, the UC Davis uh, prime program uh, works on rural health 
and telemedicine, trying to train a workforce to help rural populations in California um, and understand how to use telemedicine. And at UCSF and the joint medical program at UC Berkeley, um, our program is focused on how to care for urban underserved, or as we now often say, urban under-resourced um, communities. So what is PRIME? These uh, brave medical students that we have with us here today um, actually do um, medical school. And at the same time that they're doing medical school, they do an, an entirely extra supplementary curriculum through the PRIME program. So PRIME trains about a tenth of the medical school class at UCSF. Every year we accept 11 students on the UCSF campus and four students on the joint medical program campus at UC Berkeley. And those 15 students work together um, uh, over five years to um, uh, not only learn how to care for under-resourced communities, but also to do the community engagement work that we're gonna talk about today. I'm not gonna go through the curriculum in detail, uh, but just to say it's a really robust curriculum um, with many different facets, and we're only gonna be talking about one facet today. So um, we're gonna go through just part of the curriculum today. Um, I think what makes uh, Prime so special is that it's a mission-driven community. Um, so uh, it's very inspiring to work together when you're working towards a mission that you all believe in and that you're all dedicated to. Um, so our stated mission um, since the beginning of the program is uh, that Prime's mission is to nurture, support, and equip medical students to become leaders in underserved care. This mission was developed in, in the beginning of the program um, in 2006, and over the next decade, we've been starting to learn more and more about how health um, and health equity is achieved in society. And I think um, as we learn more and more and we learn how health care is only a small part of how we achieve better health in society, um, our mission has really broadened um, and gotten more ambitious, actually. So um, I had the fortune of spending some time with our final year students um, a couple of years ago and asking them uh, to talk about what they uh, thought was special about the Prime program and what they thought about the Prime program. And one of our students, Sophia Nori, said that Prime is an ecosystem for creating health equity, which I think very much beautifully describes um, what we're trying to do. So we thought we'd talk for just a few minutes about health equity um, before we talk about how we teach community engagement to our students. So health equity, um, in its most basic definition, is that everyone has a fair opportunity to live a long and healthy life. Um, and as you can imagine, um, there are so many ways in our society in which people do not have a fair opportunity to live a long and healthy life. So I don't know if some of you have heard the expression that your zip code matters more than your genetic code in determining your health and your life expectancy. Um, but that statement really reflects how in certain communities, if you have underperforming schools and you don't have good grocery stores um, and you have lots of pollution from a nearby highway um, and uh, no parks to play in um, and uh, no access to healthcare clinics and other services, it's really, um, we've set up our society through programs and policies and structures such that people don't actually have an equal um, and fair opportunity to live a long and healthy life. So it's actually um, in the past few years that people have been trying to think in um, more specific detail about what is health equity and how should we define it and how are we going to achieve it? Because again, if we think of what determines someone's health, Health care is a surprisingly small percentage of what determines health. Health care is estimated to be about 20% contribution to um, health outcomes. And the rest of the contributions are really 
your built environment, where do you live, what are all your social determinants of health, like your access to jobs and education and housing, um, and then um, uh, what are your individual risky behaviors in life, um, many of which are determined by the opportunities you had as a child. I spoke yesterday on trauma-informed care and how adversity in childhood actually directly influences our biology so that we have a higher risk of risky health behaviors um, later in life. So health equity here, to break it down a little bit more, um, is um, again, that everyone has a fair and just opportunity to be as healthy as possible. And this requires removing obstacles to health. And um, the authors, um, uh, Paula Braveman uh, works at UCSF and is a brilliant um, policy leader and was one of the authors of this Robert Wood Johnson um, publication on health equity. Um, they spoke about removing obstacles such as poverty, discrimination, including their consequences like powerlessness, lack of access to good jobs with fair pay, quality education and health care, um, uh, housing, safe environments. Um, and so um, as you can see from this definition, um, this, this uh, achieving health equity goes so far beyond what's traditionally thought of um, as healthcare and what's traditionally been taught in medical schools as the way that we can help um, people achieve health. Um, and it's really important to think about what groups are excluded or marginalized from power and from resources in society, um, because access to power and privilege and resources um, are so influential in achieving health. Um, so we can think of an extreme example. Um, for example, if you are um, incarcerated because um, you have um, uh, been targeted um, on the basis of racism, um, you have a higher risk of being incarcerated as um, <coughs> a black or Latino person in our state, and then um, you're directly excluded, actually, from participation in society, physically excluded because you're isolated, but then your voting rights are also taken away and you're not actually participating in, in influencing um, the policies in society. So that would be an extreme example of actually being removed from uh, resourced communities. Um, but you can think of many uh, um, other examples as well in the ways in which people are excluded or marginalized um, from particular <coughs> resources. So the models that are emerging now to actually achieve health equity is that on the outer circle, you see that the drivers of health equity are social and economic um, disparities and political um, access to political power, really, um, that determines um, the health of a community. Um, so if all of those things are driving the health of a community, then the solutions um, to achieve health equity actually need to involve empowering or, or at least um, amplifying the voices of um, community members so that they can participate in and in fact drive or lead the changes in their communities um, as, as they know what obstacles they are facing um, and have ideas about how best to uh, remove those obstacles. So in the center, we sort of see um, the healthiest communities, how can we achieve those? First of all, it's developing like a shared vision where um, uh, public health leaders, healthcare providers, and all sectors of society would participate um, with communities and community-based organizations to develop a shared vision. What do we think is just? What do we think is equitable? And how can we partner together? Um, and then we would, ha we would need to, and we do need to, work across many different sectors to achieve health equity. It's not actually um, something that any one sector, like the housing sector or the healthcare sector um, or the schools can fix by themselves. We need to figure out how to have partnerships in order to achieve health equity. And we're going to be speaking about those partnerships today. 
So how can universities or academic institutions participate in promoting health equity? I don't know if some people may have heard the, the term anchor institution, um, but um, it, you can think of lots of different ways in which an academic institution could actually participate in promoting health equity in partnership with community. So some of those ways might be directly hiring people from under-resourced communities or investing in local community businesses, right? Um, others would be admitting students specifically um, uh, that have that expertise and that knowledge about what under-resourced communities are experiencing um, and therefore can um, have incredible expertise in how to solve um, problems related to health in under-resourced communities. You can, of course, provide direct clinical care um, for under-resourced communities, which we do at UCSF and at um, uh, San Francisco General as well. And then you can partner with communities to work on um, local, city and county policy, state policy, federal policy issues, um, and programs that influence health. Um, you can also do research in partnership with communities. So you can do community-based participatory research where the community is actually um, uh, proposing questions uh, that they would like a university partner to help them answer and then participating fully in that research. And what we're going to talk about today are community engagement projects that can be done in partnership with universities and communities. And I would say that UCSF is going through a uh, really incredibly creative time of thinking uh, very deeply about how to form um, really em um, empowering and productive and equitable um, university community partnerships. And PRIME actually participates. PRIME is a, it's a very small program, obviously, within the larger context of the academic institution. But we actually participate in all of these forms of promoting health equity, aside from doing a lot of hiring um, from the community. We, we participate in all of these different ways of promoting health equity. So our community engagement curriculum um, uh, is robust. We have competencies that students are expected to achieve. Um, and we have training on how to do community engagement, which um, Aisha Queen Johnson is going to share with you next. Um, we have a project requirement. So the students are going to share projects that they've done um, because they're required to actually do projects. And then we have mentorship and supervision built into all of those projects. And um, reflection, really taking the time to pause and think about how your project is working, how your partnership is working. And then we want the students to have practice in writing grants for future work that they're going to do as public health leaders. So we actually apply to foundations to get larger grants so that we can pass on smaller grants to the students and they have a grants program where they can apply for money to support their community partner for their project. Um, we do all sorts of different community engagement work and projects. So we uh, do outreach to pipeline programs. We actually, through the faculty, staff, and students of Prime, we reach between 1,000 and 2,000 students from minority and um, under-resourced backgrounds um, in the state, usually, um, and certainly locally. Um, we do one-time health education workshops in the community. Um, education events in which community partners come to UCSF or come to UC Berkeley and help us, and then all of these other types of uh, service learning projects that Aisha Queen Johnson is going to describe to you. Um, and I'd just like to say it has been uh, transformational in my life, certainly, to get to work in this community, um, but I think it is uh, really um, profoundly um, moving and meaningful for the students to get to work in a mission-driven community that reflects their values. So um, every year we have a retreat at the beginning of Prime, and the students um, uh, tell us and share with us their top three values in life, um, the values that have gotten them through the hard times as well as, as, well as the good times and what they really believe in. Um, and as you can see, um, 
uh, when we put all their values together, the larger um, uh, the larger words are the words that are sh were given by more people. So you can see that when we ask students about their values, community really um, shines through as um, one of the most important values. And justice, empowerment, equity, resilience, um, these values um, are aligned with our mission. So I'm going to stop there. And Aisha Queen Johnson is going to introduce herself and speak, and then our students. Good evening, my name is Aisha Queen Johnson and I'm the Administrative Program Director for the PRIME Program. And to just share a little bit about myself, um, prior to coming to PRIME, um, my background's in social work and I worked in a nonprofit agency working with pregnant and parenting teens. And um, through that experience, I'd have opportunities where learners, researchers, and uh, faculty would want to come and do projects with our clients. And um, maybe not well-intentioned, but maybe not well thought out, the projects. And whether it was poor timing or lack of communication or not really ultimately the benefit of the young people who would be asked to share of themselves. So a lot of negotiation had to take place whenever I was um, developing projects with um, uh, the university. Um, so when I learned about Prime and I heard they were looking for somebody from the community to come and help influence what the curriculum would look like for learners and how they would engage the community, I jumped at that opportunity and have um, been really excited about the developing the curriculum that the students have. Um, getting the students out of the classroom, learning and actively engaging in the community is a top priority. To fully address the health of patients and students, um, to address the health of patients, students must understand the context in which patients work, live, and are supported. Understanding this broader context sheds light on how structural barriers limit the full impact of care from upstream health promotion at the community level to downstream management of disease. Medical students through experiential learning see in real time how physicians can play a role in addressing these barriers and use their education and skills to help address social determinants of health in the communities that they will serve. The process of learning healthy community assessment engaging stakeholders with resources to help improve health and learning how to apply evidence towards policy change are empowering and provide a framework for how to practice medicine as a form of social justice. Our learners gain an appreciation of, for their role in overcoming structural barriers towards community health. So what is community engagement and how does that look in prime? Um, community engagement and service learning is a pedagogy that includes place-based learning, service, and reflection, and it is deeply embedded in our curriculum. We have site visits to community-based organizations and clinics, introducing our students to the many leaders and organizations that are working in underserved and under-resourced communities. Our students learn about the needs and assets of the communities. Our partners share the challenges and successes of their work. Students participate in a number of local health pipeline programs and offer mentorship and su support to students who are interested in a health career. They share their paths to higher education and their passion in working with them. Students work on community identified needs and support existing efforts in addressing health disparities. We, structure, we offer structured service learning opportunities during our curricular time. Examples of this have been working on evaluation projects, program quality improvement, curriculum development, and facilitating focus groups and key informant interviews. Topics have include health education for sugar-sweetened beverages, water access, community violence and safety, and community health initiatives. The students not only learn about community processes in addressing health concerns, but they also participate in pushing those efforts forward. So who are our community partners? They're clinics, hospitals, community-based organizations. We work with community leaders and advocates, sometimes patients, public agencies such as the Department of Public Health, school districts, and policymakers. And who are our academic partners? 
So for the purpose of this conversation, we're talking about campus and community um, partnerships. So our partners would be our students, trainees, faculty, and staff. So to, to train our students and get them prepared to do the work in the community, we really want to base our foundation of community engaged work with an overview of the best principles and practice in community engagement. Learning best practices allows for a foundation to build trusting relationships. And when trust is established, um, I believe best partnership work can take place. So I'm gonna go over a few of the principles and practice that we share with our students, and then I'll elaborate on some of them. So we encourage students to approach the relationship with humility, demonstrate commitment, ensure mutual benefit, build on strengths, be clear about their roles, and be all in. So approaching your partnerships with humility, cultural humility is a term we like to use, and that was developed by Dr. Melanie Turvalon, who is an alum from UCSF, and Dr. Uh, Jane Marie Garcia. And co cultural humility is actually a process which incorporates a lifelong commitment to self-evaluation and critique, to redressing the power imbalance in the physician-patient dynamic that can also include community campus partnerships, and to developing mutually beneficial and non-paternalistic partnerships with communities on behalf of individuals and defined populations. And when thinking about cultural humility, you must recognize that cultural gaps exist um, in communication styles, um, perceived timelines, training, information needs and resources, how information is disseminated and used. You have to think about the institutional um, history of, an, uh, of like a university, a research university that may go into a community and has done research in the past, but really hasn't left a lasting impact on that community or pushed forward any of the health disparities in eliminating them. So knowing that before you start, a, uh, your partnership is really key into how resistant a partner may or may not be. Um, to acknowledge that you have expertise and so does your partner. So it's important to know that individually you have something to bring to the table, but also together you have an identity. And to ensure academic program and institutional accountability with your community partner and really consider leveraging the resources of the institution. We uh, encourage our students to think about demonstrating commitment when starting their um, projects and really doing some trust building, building actions. And that can include doing your homework, um, doing a community assessment, thinking about looking on the internet and doing some research on an organization or community that you'd like to partner with. Uh, that could include, include doing a walking tour, uh, going through the neighborhood and looking at its resources, its assets, and some questions and concerns you might have about it. Um, another thing would be to introduce yourself. Make sure you're making introductions to not only the project director, but also the front staff person. You want to get to know everybody. Um, they could help navigate your direction while you're there and help you get to people who you might need when you're doing your projects. You also want to introduce yourself and make sure people understand why you're there and what your motivations are and what you'd like to learn from this experience. You want to discuss best forms of communication. Is it on the phone? Is it email? Or is it um, in person? Not everybody um, communicates in the same style. And to be clear on timelines, how long do you have dedicated to this project? Um, and what, uh, what might be the deadlines that the community partner may have in terms of access to any of their participants in their programs? Um, and this is really important. We've had um, opportunities where students who actually haven't utilized some of these best practices um, engage in partnerships. And I can recall an op a time when a student uh, wanted to do work with a youth organization and wanted to develop health education workshops for the young people. And uh, they going in with really best intentions and wanted to actually include the youth in some focus groups to really inform what the workshops would look like and had maybe six weeks tops to do this kind of work and didn't really communicate that with the partner and started in by doing some emailing 
okay, a week goes by, haven't heard back, and so the next week you're trying to find out what's going on, so you email again, and here you are two weeks into the project, and knowing that you still wanna do maybe five workshops and get a focus group going um, may not happen if you're not in close communication. And so uh, finally getting in touch with them and then saying, yes, okay, let's start doing this focus group. Well, the youth aren't available until the following week. And so again, this is just a, not, a, a barrier to getting these projects kind of up and running. Um, ultimately, to avoid some of those frustrations, it would have been good to have those, um, those few things about communication styles and access and timelines um, discussed in the beginning. Our student was able to fulfill their robust um, ideas, not five workshops, but maybe did three, but did include working with um, the youth and advising what those workshops would look like. So again, we highly stress communication, uh, making sure that there's regularly scheduled check-in times when you're doing your work. And, and in those times, you wanna make sure are you meeting your deadlines? Do you need to re-examine your goals? As mentioned before, we had to go down to maybe three workshops instead of fives. But those are important because if you're going into an organization and promising something, you wanna be able to make sure you can follow through with that. Um, and to make sure you share where you're at in the process. We had the student actually went in and did a focus group and they, the idea was to do health education workshops, but in getting to know the students, they actually wanted one session on job interviewing skills. So we kind of had to think about what we were learning in real time and learn to adjust. Another important piece is ensuring there's mutual benefit for your partner. Uh, you wanna negotiate roles. Um, you want to discuss what your strengths are individually and then what are your strengths um, as a collective and making sure that you can assign roles and who could take lead on various parts of your project. Um, if you're doing a focus group, maybe it's the community partner that will help develop those questions and then it might be the student or the faculty that will help facilitate those um, uh, discussion groups and focus groups. Um, if there's funds involved in, in these projects, you wanna make sure that um, you all are in those conversations of how those funds will be used. Um, if there will be a publication at the end of this partnership, are you going to make sure that the community is also presented as an author on that? Our partnerships with the youth, um, with the students, can be limited in time, so you want to discuss sustainability of partnerships and what is your impact when you're in the organization. So you may consider documenting and even laminating your processes and putting them in a binder so that when you leave and another organization or students come on in to work with this partner that they can start fresh. They don't have to start fresh. They can pick up where someone's left off and they have a template for the work that they've done. Um, and making sure you're clear about what your goals are from the very beginning. Why are you wanting to do this project? And making sure that you understand what the community partner is going to get out of that. Um, making sure that there's role clarity is really important. And there's uh, knowing who's gonna do the check-ins, who's taking lead on which part, and are we clear about the timelines. Um, you wanna make sure that there's shared facilitation and also that there's documented, agreed upon tasks and timelines. So you have a reference point to go back and to continuously help having clarity in the project and keeping track of your ultimate goals. There are even more formal processes such as the Memorandum of Understanding, which is an MOU that's more of a contract where you can work with your partner to really establish, especially if it's a long-term project and lots of different components to it, it helps to clarify who's um, responsible for what piece. We include reflection time in um, all of the work that we do. We encourage our students to do written reflection and also group reflection. And I think that our students learn a lot from taking a pause and thinking about what they've experienced and to understand um, anything new that they've uh, learned from these opportunities. We ask the students to do group reflections where you learn different perspectives and viewpoints of what people have experienced. We also encourage us, uh, the students to work with their community partners and sharing their reflections with the partner and what the partner may have gotten from this opportunity and how they might work forward in the future. So I wanna review some of our main takeaway points from uh, our 
our practices and principles that we like to share with the students, and that is to approach potential community partners with questions, curiosity, and humility, to build in trust, building ac actions, and it's essential to its success, to be clear about your roles, and there's um, facilitated structures to help that, whether it's documenting those things, having regular check-in times, and ensuring that the benefit of this partnership is mutual. And check in along the way and evaluate how this is all going. It's really important to have that communication ongoing. And reflection is critical for learning. So as Lee had mentioned earlier, the, we, the PRIME program does a lot of community engaged work and we're there to really support our students in um, those processes. We offer a lot of individual mentorship and we offer support in facilitating partnerships and working through the project goals and objectives. We also have um, time where we check in with a partner as well and offer any um, key resources to our partners in terms of partnership and what does that look like. And I think that's a key part of our program is having some structured facilitation of those partnerships and access for community members to work with a, an a program that can help facilitate those partnerships. And again, we have um, funds, which is really good to help support our process too. Okay, and now I want to just share a few uh, pearls from our students about what they've had, how they've expressed learning uh, the, about co their community engaged process. And a few are, we learn from the community, we learn in the community, we learn about the historical and structural factors that provide context for why there are health disparities. We learn about communities through a strength and asset-based perspective. And now we'll have Jolene talk about her experience. Okay, hello everyone. My name is Jolene Kokroko, and I am a medical student here at UCSF. And I actually finished my third year of medical school in May and have since actually been at UC Berkeley doing a one-year um, public health master's degree and with a concentration in maternal child health. So I've been um, researching and learning about all of these things that Lee and Aisha have talked about. So it's really nice to be here and talk with you about a project that I did in my first year of medical school. Um, during my first year of medical school with another classmate in the prime program, Olivia Park, who is also doing her master's program on the East Coast. So the project that I'm gonna talk about is called Youth Creating Change, and we like to call it YCC for short. And YCC is really a youth empowerment program that grew out of a partnership between UCSF Prime Program and a community-based uh, local violence prevention program in San Francisco. And for the most part, the participants were youth who came from San Francisco, um, from neighborhoods that have been disproportionately affected by poverty, violence, and crime. Some of them you may have heard of, such as the Tenderloin, the Mission District, Bayview Hunters Point, and Visitation Valley. Um, and like most of San Francisco these days, these neighborhoods have been heavily affected by gentrification and have shifting demographics. And a lot of the youth, the high school students that we worked with, were kind of caught in the middle of those things. Actually, I'm gonna go back one more um, and talk about um, what it is that we actually did during the program. So over the years, um, this has been a partnership that has been around for many years, and over the years, it looks a little different each year depending on the high school students who are involved and the, the UCSF prime students. Um, what's been consistent throughout the whole program is that it's youth empowerment centered, that the youth really create and take on projects, um, really drive what we're doing and um, we're there to support them along the way. The year that I participated was 2015, and the youth identified some of the most concerning um, issues in their own neighborhoods um, that they wanted to highlight and address. Um, during the project, the youth were took on the roles of project organizers, CFOs, um, PR representatives, and really did most of the work, if not all of the work, um, to kind of promote the project, learn about the project, and do research. And Olivia and myself, along with uh, two other community partner um, leaders, met with the youth about every week or every other week from January to August of 2015. 
So our, our um, project goals and the participant goals we had for the students, we really wanted them to take on project, the project and the responsibilities. We hope that they would gain leadership skills um, and, power, and really empower them to positively influence their own communities and contribute in the future. So learning skills today that they could see themselves using in the future to really enact change in their own communities. The organizational goals, um, we had goals for them such as youth empowerment, we wanted to be advocates for them. We wanted to foster relationships and be mentors for them. Um, and we also wanted to learn firsthand from the youth about what affects them mo most, especially in this city. Um, coming to med school here, I wasn't as familiar with the issues that were affecting people, and I really felt it was important to hear from them, especially about what was impacting their daily lives. Um, and I also wanted to learn uh, how to better collaborate with community organizers. So we had a, a number of different projects over the year. The first of them was a photo voice project. So the youth identified drugs in their schools and neighborhoods, as well as school uh, inequalities as something that they wanted to address. And this was something that they felt was a major driver of health in their own communities. So they decided to do a photo voice, photo voice project and really capture and raise awareness to these issues in their communities. So with prime funding, with the grant money, um, we were able to buy cameras for the youth to use, um, to take pictures in their schools and in their neighborhoods. We actually went on community engagement um, trips to various neighborhoods and took uh, photos with them and saw what, what they were taking photographs of. And then we also had workshops where the students chose which photographs were most meaningful for them. They did research on um, the different health disparities that they had captured in their photographs and um, actually talked about what were some of the solutions to those issues that they saw. And this is an example of one of the photographs from one of our high school students who's from the Bayview. Um, and it's oops, entitled Children's Playground. And I'll just read um, what he wrote about this photograph. He said, from a distance, you see a, ch a children's playground. But up close, you can see another location that got the end of another shootout. But what really caught my attention was how the neighborhood kids were the ones making the attempt to beautify the playground. And ways they performed that was by sketching peace symbols on the concrete and walls, along with painted handprints over the areas they felt needed the most to love. And another photograph from another student from the Bayview is entitled Teenage Kids Appetite. And she said, I have taken this picture because this is just one store of many on the same street that have some of the most popular but unhealthiest snacks right in front of the store when you first walk in. This persuades kids to buy it because it's the first thing they see. And one piece of information she found in her research was that each day African American children see two times as many calories advertised in fast food commercials as white children do. So another aspect of our project was a t-shirt design project. So the students also wanted to focus on the relationship between law enforcement and their communities. Um, this was happening at a time where there were a lot of, um, I guess kind of the beginning of the police violence was really highlighted in the media, a lot of shootings of unarmed African American men. So this was something that was really on their attention and was occurring in our own city as well. So they submitted designs for different t-shirts um, and they then um, actually screen printed all of the t-shirts as you can see in the photographs um, at the Boys and Girls Club in the mission. Um, and through this project, the youth learned basic business management skills. Um, they learned how to budget, how to buy the t-shirts, how to um, pay the Boys and Girls Club for actually using their resources, and then profit mar margins in marketing. Um, I also learned a lot about budgeting through this project. And we actually were able to work with a gallery, a local gallery in the mission to showcase the students' photo voice projects as well as sell their t-shirts. Um, this was a really unique opportunity for them. Some of them had never been in an art gallery before. Um, nor any of the great museums that we have here in the city. So um, it was really fantastic for them to be able to showcase their projects and to sell their own art. Um, and the youth chose the title of the ex exhibit to be This Is Not Normal. 
um, and they curated, they installed, they decided all the prices for their art and they advertised the show. Um, and that evening was well attended by many community members and their families and they actually sold five pieces of their artwork. The last, oh, here's some more um, photographs from the art installation. And as you can see in this photograph here, um, this is the, the um, title piece for the show, This Is Not Normal. And then the last thing we did um, was hold summer workshops after the school year ended because we felt like this was a really high risk part of the year for a lot of high school students. Um, and we also kind of were attached to them at that point and didn't really want to stop seeing them. Um, so it was an extension of the academic year projects. So we held five workshops over the summer to address some of the other issues that the youth had brought up as being important to them um, that weren't addressed in the photo voice or the t-shirt project. These included things like race and racism, community violence, teen health access, substance use, and college prep and resume um, workshops. So this was an opportunity for the youth and the YCC leaders to discuss these issues and also bring in guest speakers for them. So through the community um, partnership, we learned a lot. Um, in this picture here, this is um, Olivia, the other medical student, myself, and then our community partners here, Gabe and Theo. So through the project, we learned a lot about the importance of setting goals, um, as Aisha had gone through, um, being consistent in showing up every weekend, even if we had exams and other things going on in our lives. The students expected that we be there, so we um, figured out that that was really important to earn their trust. Um, having good community with the students as well as our community partners, and doing regular check-ins and reflections. And really at the end of the project, we had been with them for a number of months, so really bringing closure to the project and making sure that we didn't just leave our partners or the students kind of um, in the dust. We really wanted to say these relationships were important and um, we're still in contact with them today. Um, so with that, I'll end the presentation. Hurt. Good evening, my name is Sidra Bonner. I'm a fourth year medical student. I also took a gap year in between my third and fourth year of medical school to do my master's in public health at Harvard concentrating in health policy. Um, I'm currently applying into general surgery, interested in trauma surgery or surgical oncology. And I think that my time in prime has truly informed uh, my decision making in terms of what career paths um, and particularly the project that I did um, that I'm going to talk about that I did during my first year of medical school has definitely contributed to my interest, particularly in trauma surgery. Um, so before I start, I think the best way for me um, to let you know what my project is about is actually to let kind of the students, um, is to let the students uh, speak for themselves. I noticed a lot of things that had to do with health. Having the camera, that kind of like opened up your mind, your eyes even more to the to the situation that is a lot of stuff that's going around that's unhealthy. When we were walking around, we had students fill out like a chart that had like, what do you notice about food access? Where do you notice the parks are? Over the five weeks, they were able to take a bigger, or to have a bigger picture of really what health means. We can find so many things that's unhealthy out here. It's just people don't see it yet. They don't realize it. So when you take a picture of it, it just, it brings it to life. Where I live at, there's about four liquor stores on every corner that I live, and they all sell the same thing, alcohol and unhealthy snacks. So having this around makes it too easy for people to grab it and fall into the addiction. Every corner has a, a liquor store, but only some neighborhoods have the boys and girls clubs. It's pollution, it's pollution. There's no way of getting around it. But you think they'll find a way like, to make some kind of new alternative fuel that won't pollute the air, but they don't. Mm -hmm. you, never really, you never really know until 
when you really look at it, and that's what I think the cameras is doing. It's like giving you an opportunity to really look at stuff and open your eyes for it. So yeah. All right. So we have a volunteer for the first. Who wants to go first? Sani. All right. Hassan. So today is the final session of our five-week seminar focused on health disparities and community health. Growing up in Oakland, you get used to seeing people hurt, people drunk, high, or psyched out their mind. This one, this is something positive. People can go exercise, a nice park, Fruitville District. I don't think there's anything in the medical education that can replicate what I learned. I am by no means an expert in what it is like to be an adolescent in West Oakland but at least it gives me a little bit of a foundation to ask questions that maybe I wouldn't ask if I had not done this project. Um, so that's a brief video um, of our project, but in terms of more details, so um, in the spring, I guess, of my first year, I knew that I wanted to do a community project during the summer in between our first and second years, and I was particularly interested in the issue of like injury prevention, gun violence um, in Oakland. It was something that I think we talked a lot about in the first year of medical school, but I a, am not from the Bay Area. I'm originally from Denver. Um, but it was something that came up in a lot of conversations in Prime with a lot of people who were originally from the, Bay, from the Bay Area. So it was something that I was very interested in. So I reached out to our fantastic Prime um, faculty and staff and asked them, like, who are the people that you think would be great contacts to get getting to Aisha's point around trust? I knew that, you know, coming in as a med student, as an outsider to a community organization saying, here are my fantastic ideas, probably was not the most appropriate thing. Um, and so luckily through contacting Aisha um, and other people at um, UCSF Prime, they were able to link me and a fellow student, Fabi Molina, who uh, worked on this project with me, to Irene Yen, who is someone who works at the Center for Vulnerable Populations, which is a large institute based at San Francisco General Hospital. And they do tons of not only research, community engagement, community participatory research, but they do a lot of work with medical students who are particularly interested in health equity um, and all of the things that it, uh, health equity means. So talking to Irene Yen, she actually had a really formal relationship with CiviCore, well-established. Um, so CiviCore is a nonprofit that's based in Oakland. Um, they particularly work with 18 to 26 year olds um, who are completing their high school diploma. Um, many of the people who are in CiviCore are individuals who are like, um, have previously been incarcerated in youth, um, have dropped out of high school for various reasons in terms of, you know, their high schools either shutting down due to like low performance, um, other issues that have complicated their journey to completing a high school diploma. So um, during our reach out, like reaching out to CiviCorp once Irene Yen, we talked to her, talked about what we thought would be a great photo voice project. We sat down with Daniel, who is the main social worker at CiviCorp. So he does a lot of just guidance counseling. As you can imagine, a lot of the students um, who are a part of CiviCorp have had incredibly, um, you know, difficult lives with a lot of not only like psychosocial trauma and various forms of trauma. So he has incredible relationships with all of the students there. And so he was our first person that we met with. And we met with him over the course of like three months to really talk about what we thought would be a good curriculum for the month of August. And so once we had a great idea, we pulled in the art uh, director at CiviCorps, Avery, who um, is a phenomenal artist himself and is very, uh, linked into the art community in Oakland. And so he was really the perfect person for this project. And so he was teaching a class on Friday mornings. And so what we decided is for three hours every Friday through August, we would do this five week curriculum um, focused on health equity. So for our first session, we did like an introduction um, of ourselves leading the course, as well as discussing what health disparities are. And we also did this activity called Walk the Line where you say a statement such as, I've experienced gun violence in my community, and if you've experienced that in your community, you walk to the other side of the room. And for me, that was an incredibly um, impactful activity. Um, we talked a lot that actually, we were planning for that to be like 10 or 15 minutes, and it turned out to be like an hour long of us just discussing like, what are the experiences that every single person in that room had dealt with. 
Um, our second session was using actually a lot of the tools that Prime had provided us. So we talked with them about the basics of a community assessment and how do you engage with your own community, how are ways in which you can evaluate things going on in your community as it relates to health. Um, and then for the sessions three, uh, we just went and walked around their own neighborhoods. So we like knew where they lived. We had luckily tons of funding from Prime, so each student got a camera. And we walked around Oakland for about five hours and just took photos um, and had them answering a sheet of paper around, what do you notice about grocery stores? What do you no notice about bike paths and things like that? And then we had a session after that where we were putting all the photos and had people writing papers about their experiences. And then we had our final session. And one thing that I always remember about our final session is we had a student who I won't name, but he was late to the final session because he uh, had walked outside of his home and the police had like, just like saw him walking around and decided that like they were going to like enter his house because they just did not trust him. And so he was about like an hour late to our final session because the cops had gone into his house and like searched around and he had two kids and it was just, he actually changed his final paper relating to his, paper, uh, to his photos to just like, detail that experience like on his way to our final session he just wrote this incredibly powerful statement about what that meant to him and how it was reflected in his photos um, so we worked with a total of 15 students during the course of our five weeks in our final session we had this art exhibit where we invited not only people within CiviCorps itself um, but then we also invited tons of people from Prime Irene Yen who is our initial connection um, and other people in the Prime program. And so that was amazing, and that was kind of our like hoorah moment. And then we actually went back in November, because um, we concluded at the end of August, and then we went back in November when they were all graduating, getting their high school diplomas to celebrate with them. So.